Hallelujah, he is in this place today. You may be seated. Praise God, praise God. In Luke chapter 4 and 35, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. When I was reading this and studying this verse of Scripture, Jesus rebuked this devil. He didn't allow him to hurt him, but the devil decided to throw him in the midst to try to take his life, try to destroy him. He threw him down in the midst, and he wanted to take his life, but he did not hurt him because Jesus did not allow it. Praise God. In verse number 36 of that same chapter, and it says that they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirit, and they came out. Jesus Christ has all authority. He has all power. Praise God. It's by his power and his authority that he has dominion over every devil. Praise God. Also, his fame spread abroad. This was the third miracle of his ministry. But yet, everyone realized the power and the authority that he had. It was very clear to the people that he had power over nature. It was very clear that he had power over demons. It was very clear that he had power over disease and death. In Matthew, the uh, eighth chapter in the 16th verse, when evening was come, they brought unto him many that were sick, many that was possessed with the devil, and he cast out the spirit with his words and healed all that were sick. His words had authority. His words had power. Luke chapter 6, verse 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him. For there went virtue out of him. Say virtue. There is power in the virtue of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you just a little bit about virtue. Praise God. In Mark chapter 5, verse 30, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who has touched my clothing? And the disciples were a little bit amazed because they said to him that there is people all around you. There's a crowd and there's many people that are touching you. And how is it that you say, someone has touched me? But he was saying that someone has touched me and took the virtue or the power of that virtue because he had perceived that virtue had went out or a healing had went out. And he looked around in the crowd and he saw her right there. She was healed from her infirmities. Twelve years, she spent all of the money that she had on physicians. And Jesus comes along, and she touches the hem of his garment. There was virtue in every part of him. I believe that she could have touched his sandals. I believe that she could have touched any part of him. And it was just the hem of his garment. Or it could have even been the sash that was swinging as he was walking. But she reached out and she touched him. And the power of healing 
left his body and went into hers. Virtue is something that Jesus Christ has given to us. Believe it or not, as we grow spiritually, we grow in virtue. According to 2 Peter 1 and 5, and it says, And besides this, giving all diligent, add to your faith virtue, and virtue to knowledge. I feel the power of God. In faith, our virtue increases. In knowledge, our virtue increases. In self-control, our virtue increases. Uh, In perseverance, our virtue increases. In godliness, our virtue increases. In brotherly kindness, our virtue increases. In love, our virtue increases. I know that God gave us the power in this last day to touch and people would be healed. Praise God. Praise God. It wasn't just for the church in that day, but today people are still getting healed. Praise God. As I went up with Sister Randy's mother and I prayed for her, I felt that something was going to be uh, just done right then and there. I don't know what it was. I told Sister Randy as we were walking out, I said, I I don't think there's a problem here. I don't think they're going to find anything. God is moving all the time. I believe it. Let's give him praise. Let's lift up his name. Hallelujah. There's power in this place. There's virtue in this place. There's authority in this place. Jesus Christ is here right now in Jesus' name. How many people know that through it all, God is worthy?
Oh, yes, it will. Everything we encounter here in life can seem so devastating, it can seem so overwhelming at times. And it's really easy for us to some way forget that all this stuff really isn't real. This is temporary. This is, yeah, it's real. If you pinch yourself, you drop a book on your toe, it'll hurt, all that kind of stuff. So this isn't some kind of existentialism here going on where we're all a figment of our imagination and nobody really exists. I've always wondered how somebody can have a figment of their imagination if they don't exist because then there'd be a no imagination to have a figment of. Anyway, what really counts is not what's going on here. What really counts is what happens after here. And the reason this counts is because we're getting ready for what happens after here. And I'm just like you, you know, you get busy and got houses to take care of and cars to deal with and sickness to overcome and bills to pay and stuff and stuff and stuff. And amongst all that stuff, it's really easy to get lost and keep your eyes, take your eyes off of the real prize, which is Jesus Christ himself. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can go ahead and put that first slide up there. If you are, have in your possession something like this and you are internet connected you can actually go to this link here that's shown here and you can actually follow along with the scriptures and notes and stuff like that if you are so inclined um, many of you have smartphones anyway and you're checking baseball scores and everything so I thought it'd be beneficial oh did I say that I, I did that come out was that out loud oh Football season is starting very soon. It's always interesting, you know, <laughs> it's always interesting if you turn around and look up there, there's three people up there, and there's a camera that's there, and a camera that's there, and a camera that's right there, and we know what goes on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, if you would like to follow along from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 10 through 14. And I'm going to read from, this is actually the modern King James Version. Verse 10, And Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were very afraid. And the sons of Israel cried out to Jehovah, and they said to Moses, Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness because there were no graves in Egypt? Why have you dealt this way with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Get this next verse. Did we not tell you this word in Egypt, saying, Let us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than then we should die in the wilderness. That, that just amazes me. That somebody would choose slavery over the potential of freedom. Patrick Henry, famous quote, give me liberty or give me death. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who have died for freedom. But to say... You know what? It would have been better for us to stay in Egypt than come out here and die in the wilderness. That's just amazing. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. I might have said something different. I'm just being honest. I, I might have, there might have been something different that came out of my mouth about that time. <laughs> Stand still and see the salvation of Jehovah, which he will prepare for you this day. 
For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall never see them anymore. Jehovah shall fight for you. And this is why we're reading this from the modern King James Version, because of this phrase, and you shall be silent. Now, the King James says, and you should hold your peace. But this phrase, the way it's quoted here, and you shall be silent, gives a little bit more punch. In other words, in the modern Keith Manley version, what Moses said was, and you should shut up. There are a lot of times that the best thing that you can do is just close the yapper. <laughs> You're all dismissed. You may go home. No. <laughs> we are going to go down a few verses into verse 24 and read verses 24 through 31. And in the morning, watch, it happened that Jehovah looked to the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels and made them go heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for Jehovah fights for them against the Egyptians. And Jehovah said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and Jehovah overthrew the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There did not remain so much as one of them. But the sons of Israel walked upon dry land in the middle of the sea. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So Jehovah saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which Jehovah did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared Jehovah and believed Jehovah and his servant Moses. And you may be seated. The back story on this is that some 400 years previously, the descendants of Abraham had gone into Egypt because of famine. And they had left, Joseph and his family had left their home and went into a part of Egypt and there were reunited with Joseph who was serving as the second in command of the Egyptian Empire at the time. God had orchestrated that, and we don't have time for that whole story. But he had orchestrated that so that Joseph would be there, and so that Jacob and the family could be saved. But they stayed there. They became comfortable in the land that had allowed them to come. And in their place of comfort, comfort they eventually became slaves. I think there's a message in that, although it's not the message I'm going to preach today. 400 years later, Moses is brought onto the scene by God to deliver Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. And you have, I'm sure, heard of the 12 plagues of Egypt and all that took place, and eventually the firstborn died firstborn of all families, of all cattle, of all sheep, of all animals, wherever and whomever and whatever household did not have the blood of the sacrificial lamb sprinkled upon the doorpost and lintel, the firstborn died. And in that night of horrendous grief in the land of Egypt, Israel walked out. And they go a few days' journey and they come to the banks of the Red Sea. And there they face an obstacle that they have no ability to overcome. And it was there that they looked back and saw the army of the Egyptians hard after them. 600 chariots of the finest of the best of the best of the best 
of the fighting army of the Egyptians, which was the then known world power, dominates. They controlled everything that was within grasp. And the army was coming after them. And I find it interesting that the Bible says that 600 of the best chariots, oh yeah, and all the other chariots came too. Now I don't know how many chariots there were, but 600 is a lot. And if that wasn't all of them, that's a lot, lot. And along with the chariots came the army led by Pharaoh himself. And they're approaching as fast as they can. And Israel looks back and they have nowhere to go. Behind them is Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. Ahead of them is the Red Sea. To their left and to their right are mountain ranges that it would be difficult, very difficult, for three million people to somehow get over. See, in their minds, as they stood there at the banks of the Red Sea, all they were were slaves that were on the loose. They had escaped from the land of Egypt, but they hadn't escaped from themselves. They had been allowed to leave the land of their bondage, but the bondage had come with them because they had been for 400 years slaves. That means that their parents were slaves. Their parents' parents were slaves. Their parents' parents' parents were slaves. For 10 generations, they had lived in slavery. By this point in time, every Israelite, Israelite alive had been born in slavery, knew nothing other than slavery. Their family knew only slavery. Their ancestors knew only slavery. There was no one in the camp of Israel outside of Moses himself and himself alone that knew what it was like to live in freedom. Their thought process was one of slavery. Their behavior was one of slavery. 400 years, 10 generations, if a generation is 40 years, had lived under the bondage of the Egyptians. And so they stood at the Red Sea with no ability within themselves to see beyond their certain destruction. They, they couldn't, they, there's no way they could have understood and even believed that there was somehow salvation. There was no framework for them other than the 12 plagues. There was nothing that gave them any kind of structure, any kind of thought process, any kind of belief system that would ever put them in a place where they could stand at the banks of the Red Sea and believe, let alone even hope, that somehow they could cross. So Moses stood there, and he says, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh Uh-huh, sure. Yeah. Mm. He said, do not fear, right? Don't be afraid. So you're standing in the middle of County Farm, and you're standing there for some reason, and you look up, and there's a Mack truck bearing down on you, and somebody standing at your side says, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, everything's going to be okay because I'm going to be over here on the sidewalk when it comes past. But see, Israel couldn't get to the sidewalk. So they see the Mack truck bearing down, and they have nowhere to go. And they have no faith. They have no belief. They have no structure that could give them any kind of hope in the circumstance. But on that day, the 400 years of slavery came to an end. On that day, the slaves became free. On that day, their captors, their masters, those that held them hostage were destroyed. On that day, the army of the Egyptians was completely annihilated. And from that day on, the nation of Egypt was never again a world power. On that day, God intervened in their lives. On that day, There was death. On that day, there was absolute destruction. On that day, in the midst of the death and the destruction, there was something else. There was deliverance. And so I want to preach this morning on the 3D effect. 
death, destruction, and deliverance. See, when they came from that place of Egypt, and they came across that area and wandered through the wilderness of sin, and they came to the banks of the Red Sea, they experienced something they had never experienced before. They experienced freedom. They experienced, for the first time in their lives, the fact that their masters were not telling them what to do. That those who were in control of their lives were not telling them what to do. That no one could tell them it's time to get up, it's time to go to bed, it's time to work, it's time to work harder. There were no taskmasters with whips. There was no slave drivers that were demanding more out of them. For the first time in their life, they were set free. But again, they were only free physically because still trapped in their own minds and spirits was the heart and the mind and the thought process of a slave. We find then that they travel across the Red Sea and, and they come to this point and they, they come to a place of, of even further deliverance when they're finally going to come back into their promised land, the land of Jacob, the land that was their inheritance. And they came to the Jordan River and there again the thought process and philosophy and beliefs of the slaves rose to the top. And when God said, you're able to go in and possess Jericho, they said, no, we're not. And so God took and caused them to wander through the wilderness for 40 years until all those who were 40 years of age and older had died off in the wilderness. He was trying to break the slave mentality. He showed them repeatedly miracles, signs, and wonders. He fed them from a rock that followed them. Yeah, you heard me. A rock that followed them. The Bible says there was a rock that followed them. Now then, you can choose not to believe that or whatever you want to. But the Bible says a rock followed them. There was a pillar of fire and a cloud that would go with them to protect them. They came to the waters of Merah, and the waters were bitter, and, and God restored the waters. They didn't have any food, and so God called manna to rain down from heaven. Manna literally means, what is it? They didn't know what it was. But they would gather up enough on six days to feed themselves, and on the seventh day, there was no manna. And if they gathered up too much manna, by the, by the first day of the next week, the manna had turned rotten. God was teaching them, my provision for you is sufficient. I will provide what you need, when you need, how you need it. He was trying to take them from people of slavery to people of freedom. But that takes a while for it to happen because your thought process has to change. Your belief system has to change. Your view of yourself has to change. And so 40 years later, they come back to Kadesh Barnea and back to Jericho. See, the, the death and destruction we don't like. It, it makes us feel unsettled. I, I want to be careful what I say here because I don't want to give any kind of, of thought process that I'm saying this is okay. But there has been horrible atrocities committed in the hands of the, the revolutionary Muslim world. And we've seen the videos and we've heard about it. And people have said... What kind of God would command his followers to do this? And then I read the Old Testament. That's really unsettling. Now, I'm not trying to shake your faith. I'm trying to make you understand something here. That God is not at all interested in preserving any lifestyle 
that will attempt to overthrow, to conquer, and to combat against his word. And in the Old Testament, what God was trying to do was to break Israel of the slave mentality. So the armies of Israel of Egypt died in the sea. All of them. That seems so harsh. Couldn't he have just closed the water and let them gone back to Egypt? No, because Israel still would have been slaves. They still would have been in bondage to an Egypt that may have a difficulty getting to them, but they would still be in bondage. And as they came into, into the promised land, God repeatedly caused them and ordered them and commanded them to defeat the enemies that they encountered because God said, this is my people, this is their land, and anyone that is here is an imposter and is, a, is not allowed to remain here. And if you allow them to remain here, they will infect you with spiritual wickedness. And it happened time after time after time that the men of Israel would marry the women of the other, other, other nations and the women of Israel would marry the, nation, the men of other nations. And in a short amount of time, less than a generation, they would be back into slavery, back into bondage to some other nation because they had committed sin again. So we come to the place of death and destruction, and we want deliverance, but sometimes we're uncomfortable with the death and the destruction that has to come first. Jericho, in Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. <clears throat> so the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, and ass with the edge of the sword. Everything. That, that again, humanly, that's disturbing to me. But you have to understand, they're still fighting with slavery. This is the promised land. This is the land of Jacob. This is the land that God had given to Abraham when he said, wherever you walk, it's going to be yours. And that means whoever was living there didn't belong there. And there are too many times in our walk with God that we allow imposters to camp on the promises that God has given to us. He wants us to utterly destroy them. He does not want us to allow the imposters of doubt and the imposters of unbelief and the imposters of materialism and the imposters of affluence and the imposters of other gods in our life to encamp in our spiritual promised land. But at times, we are uncomfortable with the death and the destruction that needs to happen for us really to be free. Some of you in this building today struggle in a walk with God because you're not really ready to kill the old man. You want to be saved and you want the promises and you want the healing and you want the joy and you want the everlasting life, but you also want the things of the world. You're not quite sure that you can kill the old man. But I'm here to tell you, if you want liberty, if you want freedom, if you want to be set loose from the bondages of your past, you've got to be willing to bring the old man at an altar, at a place of Calvary, and crucify him, and put him there, and keep him there until he's dead, 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 dead. And Joshua, this verse references two young men that had spied out the country in chapter number one or two. Spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman all that she hath. So back when these two spies 
had been sent into Jericho. They had come into Jericho at night and found there a place to hide. Interesting enough, the Hebrew word for harlot is the same word that's translated innkeeper. I, I just found that interesting. I worked as an innkeeper for a while. <laughs> and so when I found that out, it was rather unsettling. <laughs> so I'm not sure what she was. Whether she was a woman of ill repute or whether she was a business woman, woman who put up lodgers. I don't know that it really makes that much of a difference. But these two spies had come and she had hid them from the king's men and had uh, helped them to escape. Her house was hard against the wall. If you want something really interesting to read, uh, go to um, biblearchaeology.org and read about the excavation of Jericho. Fascinating what they have found. It's hard for humans to, to uh, us in our day, it's hard for us to look at the story of Jericho and say, they shouted and blew trumpets and the walls fell down? Really? Well, it must have been a natural disaster. Fine, it was a natural disaster. Sure, the Egyptian army died in the Reed Sea, not the Red Sea. So they died in a marsh. To me, that's a greater miracle than them drowning in the Red Sea because 600 chariot people plus all the people in the chariots plus all the other chariots plus the entire, uh, entire, entire, <laughs> entire army of the Egyptians drowning in a marsh. Sure, if that's what you want to believe, go ahead. I had the pastor son of a Unitarian church tell me that it was the Reed Sea, and I said, okay. He went, Okay. Yeah, I said, I'm fine. Reed sea, red sea, pink sea, blue sea, purple sea. I don't really care. Sea. The fact is that they all drowned there. So you believe whatever body of water you want to believe it was, but the fact of the matter is they're all dead. All right. So these two guys come back into Jericho. They're hiding there. She lets them down over the wall and uses a rope to let them down the wall, and they escape. And she says, we know who you are. We've heard what God did for you at the Red Sea and how he provides for you, and we are terrified of the people of Israel. We know who you are, and we know you're coming to Jericho, and we know there's nothing we can do about it. Can I just tell you this, that the devil is more terrified of you than you are of him? He has nothing. He goes about as a roaring lion. A roaring lion is out to intimidate. A lion that's hunting will not roar until just before it strikes. So he's trying to intimidate us into believing that he's got something on us, but we are the children and sons of the Most High God. We are children of the Creator of all things, the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings, the God of all gods, the first, the last, the one who is, who was, and is to come. And Satan has nothing on us. He knows who you are when you kneel down to pray and begin to call on the name of the Lord. Hell trembles in fear as you call on the name of Jesus. Why? Because the prayer of the righteous shall save the sick. The prayer of the faithful shall cause things to occur in the realm of the spirit that Satan has no ability to challenge or to stop. They knew who Israel was, and she said, we're all going to die, but I helped you, so make me a promise. Who was she talking to? She wasn't talking to Joshua. She wasn't talking to one of the leaders of one of the tribes. 
She was talking to two young men. But they had been commissioned by Joshua to do a task. Some of you sit here and you doubt your ability in the spirit because you're not pastor. You're not an elder. You're not experienced. I'm here to tell you, you have been commissioned by God for a mission. And when you speak, God stands behind it. When you speak the word of God, God will make it come to pass. If you're two young men, if you're two young women, if you don't have a license, if you don't have the position, if you don't have the title, it doesn't matter to God. You're on a mission from him and he will provide the power. If you just speak the word. Oh, yeah. Sure. You just leave this hanging down from the wall. And when we come back, you and your father and your mother and your brethren and anybody else that's in the house and all your stuff will be spared. Read the archaeological digs. Guess what they found? They found one section of the wall still there with a house attached. And so when they came and they shouted and the trumpets blew and the walls came down, all except Rahab's wall. And so Joshua says, you guys, the one that you, you made the promises, <laughs> you go get her out. Guess what happened to Rahab? In the book of Joshua, she, it says she's still alive and known in, in, in Jerusalem to this day. Not to this day in, in Joshua when he wrote the book. I just thought I'd better clarify that because she'd be really, really old. That would be a miracle. Guess who Rahab became? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Rahab was a wife of of Salmon. Salmon was in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Huh. Well, I got to get back to my scripture. The spies went and got her and everybody else, and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and golden vessels, brass and iron, they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household, and all that she had. Here it is. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. So I wasn't lying. Rahab. Huh. You know, I wonder how long Rahab and her family stayed in her house before Israel came. Think of this. Noah's out there building an ark and he's preaching. And he's saying, it's going to rain. Rob, had anybody ever seen rain? No. Our dear brother, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm not even going to say that because... That, that'd be a bad analogy right now. So, Noah builds this ark. He preaches about 120 years. And when he's all done preaching, and the ark is ready, and he and his wife go in the, in the ark, 10,000 people, believers, followed him in. Right? You're all looking at like, what Bible is he reading today? He's already talked about the Keith Manley paraphrase version. Is that somewhere in there, hidden in? Who went into the ark? Noah, Sister Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Sister Ham, and Sh Sister Japheth, and Sister whatever, whatever. Eight. 120 years of preaching. Eight. And then they get in the ark, and God closes the door, and they sit there. And they sit there. And then they sit there. 
And when they did come sitting there, then they sat there some more. Good grammar. You must be homeschooled. She said it right. And when they got done sat in there, what'd they do? They sat there some more. About that time, most of us would have been crawling out the window looking for a Burger King. Or a Taco Bell. Or a La Taqueria. Or a whatever it is. Because after about five minutes of prayer, when we don't get an answer, we get really nervous. We pray for something. Well, oh, God, you're on the clock. And Noah sat there. How long did Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and her sisters and whoever else she gathered there, how long did they sit in the house waiting for Israel to come? But they weren't going to move because they knew at some point in time Israel was coming, the walls were going to come down, Jericho was going to be defeated, and if they stayed in the house, if they stayed in the house, if they stayed in the house, if they stayed protected by the scarlet, cord they were going to be saved and I'm guilty of it just like you I pray for something and I pray and I pray and I pray and I get done praying and I've got 10 minutes of prayer and the answer hasn't come and I went well God just isn't interested I guess today yes he is he gave a promise he'll fulfill the promise if you just stay in the house Ha. Huh. So here in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, 5, and 6, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. King David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. In two verses, we have three women in the genealogy of of Jesus Christ. Check out the genealogies and figure out how many women are mentioned in the genealogies. Look at it. Discover it. Research it. Find it. And here in the genealogy, there's three women, and every one of them would be considered to be questionable as being in the lineage of Jesus. Rahab may have been a harlot, may not have been a harlot, may have been an innkeeper, but I'll tell you what she was. She was a woman of Jericho, an enemy of the nation of Israel, someone who had no business being in Israel and no business being in the genealogy. Ruth, guess who she was? She was a daughter of Moab. Moab was the absolute sworn enemies of Israel, hated Israel, despised Israel. As a matter of fact, some people believe she was a daughter of the king of Moab. And guess where she is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? The wife of Uriah? Oh, yeah. This is the woman that David seduced and then turned around and murdered her husband. By law, not only should she have been stoned, but he should have been stoned as well. Not Uriah. He was already dead. King David. But God, in mercy and grace, a concept that isn't even discussed in the Old Testament, stepped forward and said, no, I'm going to spare the wife of Uriah. I'm going to spare Rachel, Rahab. I'm going to spare Ruth, and I'm going to put them smack dab in the lineage of my Redeemer. Why? So that you and I could understand. You don't belong here. You have no hope. You have no reason to hope. You have no joy. You're a, you're a Gentile. You're a sinner. You're a disgusting, filthy people. He's a wretch. And yet, you're here today. Why? Because God, in his infinite and uncalculable mercy and grace, said, I am going to reach down, and I am going to put my hand on this man. I'm going to put my hand on this woman. I'm going to bring death. I'm going to bring destruction. But in the midst of the death and the destruction, I'm going to bring deliverance. There is no singular event 
in the course of history that has been more profound than Golgotha's hill. Many of us have heard the story of Calvary so often. You'd need water too if you were screaming all the time. And the simple response is then quit screaming. Okay. Calvary. There's songs written about it. There's preachers preached since the day of Pentecost about it. Brother Jason, how many messages about Calvary have you heard in your lifetime? A lot. You can't even put a number on it. Calvary is such a pivotal point in history. Such an incredible thing that took place at Calvary. And most of us, not trying to be mean or nasty or harsh on you, I'm just telling you the truth. Most of us go days, weeks, months, and maybe Easter to Easter without really considering Calvary. Yet there's been no event in man's history that is more pivotal than that one event. We get busy. We have lives to live, places to go, things to do, people to see, bills to pay, jobs to work. We even get busy in the work of God, coming to services, worshiping. These are all good things. There's nothing wrong with any of them in and of themselves. But the Bible tells me, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Can I tell you that if you're not careful, church becomes a god above God himself. We worship and we get to the place where we like the feel of the worship and lose sight of who it is we're worshiping. Can I tell you today that when you come into the presence of God, always come before him with fear and trembling. Never take his presence lightly or for granted. He is an awesome God. And when I say awesome, I'm not using that term in the sense, hey man, that's awesome. I'm using awesome in the sense of fearful. We don't, we've never seen the power of God. Never. We have seen that much of it. The dead have been raised in this building. That doesn't scratch the surface of the power of God. We have seen healings take place that will blow your mind. But if your mind is blown by healing, think of what would happen to it if you saw God demonstrate his power in its entirety. You and I would not be able to stand. We would melt in his presence. Look at the book of Revelation. Look at the book of Zechariah. Look at the prophecies of the end time. And the people's bodies, their eyes will melt in the presence of God. And we stand or sit here today in that presence. And the only thing that keeps us alive and breathing is his grace. But in that place, as scary as that may be, there is an incredible thing that takes place because of his mercy, because of his grace. He says, come boldly before me. Come boldly before the throne of grace. He doesn't say, whimper and drag yourself forward. He doesn't say, crawl on your belly like snakes. It doesn't say, grovel. It doesn't say, somehow beg and plead. It says, come boldly before the throne of grace. This is the most awesome, incredible, powerful being that has ever been or ever will be. And
and he has given us this promise. Come boldly before my throne of grace. Why? Because of one singular event called Calvary. He was mocked. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, Jesus cried with a loud voice and died. And in that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. This blows my mind. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. You know, there's a real big craze right now that I hope none of you are actually involved with. That's this whole craze of the undead. Now, you might want to take and pull your feet back in a ways because I've got my size 26 stomping boots on right now. That stuff is unholy, ungodly, and it has no business in the life of a Christian. Huh. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, can I say about 99.9999999% of stuff that you get from the world has no business in the life of a Christian? I don't know what that point zero 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 one percent is, but I just, in case there was something. Entertained from the world? Better be careful. Do I watch movies? Sure I do. Yep, I have been known to watch a movie or two. Do I occasionally maybe watch the Packers play football? I've been known to do that now and again. For all you Bears fans, I hope you have a good season this year. <laughs> but we have to be really careful with that stuff. Do you think the enemy wants you to think rationally? Do you think Satan wants you to think godly? Do you think that anything that he produces will in some way, shape, form, or fashion help you to accomplish that? No. That's like asking if a drug dealer really cares about you. <laughs> We're the drug dealer with compassion. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just... Uh, <laughs> what? Satan doesn't like you. As a matter of fact, not on the pulpit, Mom. He hates your guts. He wants to destroy you. He wants to annihilate you. He wants to completely ruin your life and your hereafter life. He has no interest in you other than you being a tool for him to get back at God. That's all he's interested in, is using you to try to embarrass the creator. And we fall into his lies hook, line, and sinker time after time again. I know that because you're still here. If you weren't, you would already have been gone because you'd be perfect. But guess what? I'm still here too, aren't I? So I'm still working on it. Satan doesn't want you for any good. So there at Calvary, Jesus Christ 
took all of the death and destruction that had been ever talked about in the entire Old Testament. 4,000 years of man's history of sin. 4,000 years of man's heartaches and pain. 4,000 years of despair. 4,000 years of hopelessness. And he took it upon himself. And he died a death that no one else, not only no one else can die, but no one else has been willing to die. Show me Buddha. Show me Confucius. Show me a world leader such as Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler. Show me a God that would robe himself in flesh and die for his creation. A creation that had routinely rejected him, routinely had embarrassed him, routinely had disobeyed him. Go ahead, bring your offering to Buddha, the fat guy sitting on the stool or on a horse or wherever is he's sitting and ask him to forgive you. Ask him to robe himself in flesh and die upon Calvary's cross. Ask Confucius, ask any God other than Jehovah to do that. And the answer will be silence because there is no God anywhere that has ever been willing or ever will be willing or ever could be willing to become the sacrifice for man's sin. And there at Calvary, this Jesus Christ became the ultimate in death, the ultimate in destruction and also the ultimate in deliverance. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 says, wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about in those days, I need about 10 men here to, you guys, all you guys, that's five is good. You stand up here, all right? And you stand behind me and you have been my enemies and so I've conquered you. And so the conquering king would be set upon a chariot that was elevated and as he rode into the city of his city and he rode there to show his dominance he would be bringing along behind him led by ropes or chains or something all of you would be coming along behind and he would par parade those he had conquered in the streets and all the people of his kingdom would stand and cheer and shout and holler and yell and, and applause at the king and the conquering king and all of those who had been conquered were held in derision and that's exactly what Jesus Christ did when he hung upon Calvary. He took the very thing that Satan had held over our heads for all of the eternity of mankind. He held death he held the grave he held fear and he said look what I've got I've got all of these things Satan you have no power you have no authority you have no reason for being I parade you in front of my people and as people stand and they shout and they applaud at the conquering King Jesus Christ Brother Goff, yes, he had authority. Yes, he had all authority. He had keys. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Revelation 1, 17 and 18, and when I saw, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of del, death and hell. Jesus Christ had in his possession he had all of the authority, all of the power. When Jesus stood and said, all power, both in heaven and earth, is given unto me, he said he not only had all the power and authority of heaven, but he had all the power and authority of hell as well. There is nothing that can stand before the conquering king. When Jesus stood and he said, I am life, he meant I am life. And so he was the one that could give life, but he could also take life. Tell that to Ananias and Sapphira who stood before Peter and keeled over dead 
at the feet because they lied to the Holy Ghost. But also tell that to the centurion servant, Peter's wife's mother, the nobleman son of Capernaum, Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain, Lazarus, and even Jesus Christ himself who raised himself from the dead. There is no power. There is no authority. There is no strength outside of Jesus Christ. And he said, greater things than this shall you do because I go to my father. He said, go back to Jerusalem and wait there until you be endued with authority from on high. I'm here to tell you this morning that most of us, myself included, live about here in our presence with God when we should be living up here because in your heart, in your life, in your spirit, in your mind, in your life that God has given you, all power and all authority of heaven is available to you. Do you understand that? We don't have to live in bondage. If you're in bondage to thoughts, if you're in bondage to fear, if you're in bondage to behavior, if you're in bondage to your past, if you're in bondage to your future, I have a God who says I have all keys, both of death, hell, and the grave, and I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. I have come that you can be free, and he that is free is free indeed because the Son has set us free. Oh, yes, remain standing. I want you to hear this carefully. As darkness is not equal to light, neither is sin equal to grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 14 through 21. We're not going to read it all. Verse 15, this is in the message, which is part of the reason why I have it up on a slide, if you could go to that slide. Romans 5, 15 says this. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead and abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous, life-giving gift. The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoings, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes? Sovereign life in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift. This grand setting everything right that the one man Christ Jesus provides. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting out of the trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. Verse 21, jump down to that one. All sin can do is threaten us with death. And that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on. World without end. Hmm. Didn't preach from Galatians. But somehow grace came into it, didn't it? I've been born and raised as a Pentecostal my whole life. I believe the doctrine of salvation that we preach. I believe in repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, in water by immersion, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I also believe in living a godly life. But as a 58-year-old Pentecostal, grace scares us. 
because there's people that have taken grace and misused it and misapplied it. So there's this fear of grace that it's a license for sin. It's not, never has been, never will be. But can I tell you this of absolute certainty? There would be no repentance if there was no grace. There would be no baptism if there was no grace. There would be no infilling of the Holy Ghost if there was no grace. There would be no living a godly life if there was no grace. There's nothing that we have, can possess, accomplish, acquire in our walk with God if it wasn't for grace. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a license to be free from sin. Huh. Don't be afraid of grace. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first I'm waiting because occasionally something will happen that God just shows me something in the spirit. I don't exactly often know how to respond to it. So I will say being very careful to keep my eyes closed because I don't want to make eye contact with anybody right now. I will say there are some who have come into this building today. You walked in these doors. You know you're in bondage and you haven't really been willing to let God kill the things that are keeping you in bondage. If you come today, he's going to deliver you. But if you walk from this place today, you're walking away from the only thing that can deliver you. Would you sing that, Tim? Amazing Grace. Either the old version or the new one, either one. Amazing in grace As Tim sings this you can join in and sing as well if you would like but some of you need to be here at this altar really really quickly like me. he 
has come here today to deliver you. His death was a horrific thing. But in his death, there was a destruction that took place. He destroyed every yoke of bondage that could ever chain us, that could ever hold us. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Oh, God. It was grace that taught my heart. Hallelujah. To reach out to him. He's here right now. He's come here. He's orchestrated this event. So that